Hello and welcome to Plate Stack Chat. I am your host, Jason CF Media, and this is a nice midday record for me, which is a little bit unusual, and I will fight the urge to go straight to bed after the recording. I would normally say that each week I am joined by some guests, but spoilers, we will actually be having another live show on Thursday, so I guess I'm going to have to start saying each show I am joined by some wonderful guests for a chat around the virtual Plate Stack. So... Joining me this week, and YouTube has just decided to go live, joining me this week is a Canadian, a coach, a fellow podcaster. He is the host of the Box Jumper podcast, and he asked a lot of good questions in the comments section on the live show last time, so I'm hoping he can keep it up in person. Please welcome Jean saint Amand. Hi, how you doing, Jason? I'm very well. Jean. Thanks for having me. I got the name better this time. <laughs> yes, you uh, did. I was kicking myself last time. I will tell you why in a minute. Be before I do that, I have to bring in our other wonderful guest because joining Jean and myself today is an OG in the CrossFit space. He has been involved in so many aspects of the sport, even taking athletes to the games and most recently working with some of what we can only assume are future superstars of the CrossFit games at The Crown. He is the man behind the program without an A. You might have seen him speaking Spanish, but I am pretty sure he's actually English. Please welcome the fantastic John Christian Singleton. Hey, guys. Right. We're going to jump straight into name chat, first of all. Um, <laughs> John, I got your name wrong the other day, um, and, and I was kicking myself because I should know it's, it's, it's John, because it's like Jean-Luc Picard. I should have <laughs> just got that, and, and I'm sure. sorry. I apologize. I after sort of making fun of you, not making fun of you, but saying on the podcast <laughs> that you got my name wrong, I then returned it by getting your name wrong. And I then, was inexplicably adding letters to yours. Well, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I, like, I like to keep an air of mystery. Um, and then Mr. Singleton, I'm going to have to call you that just to <laughs> differentiate between the Johns. Um, what I love is that on your Instagram, you've got your middle name. Yeah. Um, well, John Singleton's quite a common name, so I've just I've just rolled with it. Email, Instagram, it's, uh, it all just got added in there. And see, the reason I find it fascinating is, um, uh, and we're not going to be speaking about kind of John's background on here. He's covered that quite extensively on Coffee Bods and Wads and on Savan's show. And I've listened to these interviews, and I always find it fascinating because I think, at least at the beginning, we had quite a similar start. Um, we both left the country at around the same age. And maybe even around the same time. How old are you? You're 37? I'm 37. Soon to be 38, but it all kind of, I'm just blurring the line until 40 now. Yeah. So I'm, I'm 36, turning 37 next month. So, and I left the country at 18 as well. So maybe a year after you. So very, very similar. Um, but the middle name thing, I lived in Italy for a long time and they don't really have middle names. Hmm. They have like a second first name. So if your name is like, I don't know, uh, john paul it is literally it's john paul not like here where you'd be you know john christian there's no middle kind of column to put that in so it causes a lot of confusion so people were kind of always obsessed when you had a middle name and if you got a phone call from the bank or something they would always just roll off the whole name um, whereas you know in england we have a middle name and no one ever uses it in fact, no, we, we tend to like one syllable as well yes <laughs> now I've got, I've got another follow-up question for you, John, because again, I've listened to a lot of these things and, uh, you know, I know like Savan will say, where are you from? And you'll be like, well, originally England. And it stops there. Where are you from in England originally? Uh, so I was brought up in Worcestershire. So I'm actually from, from Malvern, which surprisingly quite a few, there's a, a solid group of athletes training in Worcester now, which was like my, uh, my hometown. It's, it's like maybe like an hour South of Birmingham. Yeah. Yeah, my grandparents w lived in Malvern while I was growing up, so I used to go up there quite regularly. So, oh, look at this. So sorry, I know Malvern is very far from Canada, so Jean is sat there going, "What on earth?" But I there's just a few, uh, there's a, actually a, one of the agents in the space, James. His his wife and I actually went to the same school. So oh, really? there's some yeah, there's some little coincidences that come from a, a small town. There we go. Who knew? Who knew all this? Um, Okay, Jean, sorry, we'll bring you in this. Uh, where are you from originally, Jean? <laughs> uh, I was actually born in Halifax, but I was a military brat, so I moved around a fair bit uh, in my younger years. So moved to Ottawa, then I was in Germany for a couple of years, back to Ottawa, and then finally when my dad left the military, we wound up back here. Oh, nice. So I'd like to think we're all pretty well-traveled. Uh, do you speak French as well, Jean? 
I do, but I'm really out of practice. It's interesting. Not many have... excuses to use it. Like it's Halifax is a pretty English town. I mean, we don't have, there's plenty of French speakers here, but it's not a truly bilingual area of the country. So uh, it just doesn't wind up coming up very often. So I'm woefully out of practice. Oh, good excuse. It's a good excuse. Uh, and, and John, you speak Spanish. Yeah, I'll try to. I uh, I definitely wouldn't call myself fluent, but but I can get by. See, this is you know I was saying there's there's some little like crossovers, some little similarities I found when listening to you, and I I've seen like your sort of breakdown of the you know twenty four point one in Spanish mm -hmm. and explaining things like that. And I'm like, yeah, this, this guy speaks Spanish, and then I heard you say to Savan sort of this line that you kind of oh, I'm not really fluent. And I remember when I moved back to England and people would say to me, oh, do you speak Italian? And I, and I was the same. I was like, oh, I, you know, I, I worked there. So, yes, I can kind of get by, but I wouldn't really say I speak it. And then I would hear people like English people that have maybe studied it <laughs> who would say yeah. they could speak the language. And I was like, oh, yeah. if this is the bar, then yeah, yeah, I'm amazing. Don't worry. So, um, you know, I think you've got better than sort of secondary school level Spanish. I think you're beyond yeah, that. We we don't tend to be the best at uh, learning second languages. We get everything given to us with uh, with English. So. Yeah, yeah. So that must have been, because the thing I've always found is that, you know, we should learn other languages. And the default kind of is, oh, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, they all speak English. And annoyingly, it's almost true. So you do go everywhere and find somebody who speaks English. But I know you went to China and... <laughs> Yeah, there's maybe uh, there's maybe slightly different uh, in when you start going some places, the English doesn't doesn't come. Yeah. How well, much I, exposure I, to to other languages did you have before you made those those very significant leaps? Uh, very little. <laughs> um, I I don't know why I I always had resonated with Spanish. Uh, my gran was actually from uh, she was brought up in Chile. Although she never spoke any Spanish, and I don't know, it was just maybe her telling stories of coming over on the boats and stuff. Always like, just made me think about the language. Um, and then China was there was like zero connection to, to China at all, so that was really in the deep end of kind of extreme languages as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I guess with um, with Spanish, it's similar. Like I know, I know with Italian, like you can learn a load of words if you just add zioni to the end of anything. That ends, <laughs> yeah, anything that ends in shun, so like station or condition or anything like that, you just change it to zioni, and you're pretty much there. So you're like, oh, I didn't really understand anything they said apart from they definitely mentioned the train station. <laughs> Whereas Chinese, it's like there is there's nothing, there's nothing for you to kind of latch onto and be like, oh, they must have been talking about this. Yeah, it's also a tonal language, so. Like, I remember being over there, you know, I, was, I really wanted to integrate into the language. Um, and I'd walk into a shop, say something. And this is probably for like three months, just ask for something basic. And people just stare at me and just not even reply. And then finally, like after three months of trying, they finally responded to, uh, to sorry, like probably asking for bread or something like that in the shop. There you go. Yeah. But it is, I, I think I heard you say this about it, that it's... Um... Like structurally, once you understand the structure, it's actually really logical and it makes yes. more sense in English. Uh, I mean, what doesn't make more sense in English? We have irregular <laughs> verbs. Uh, um, uh, and I like that. Like, you've got like the plural thing with like men. So like, you know, I is, is was it, uh, war and we is war men. And then you, ta, ta men. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's great. Nice language. Um, oh, my good friend, Barkley, <laughs> always popping in. Hi. I saw Barclay was, uh, I, I was just listening to one of the Coffee Wads and Pods. I heard, uh, was Barclay commenting on there with uh, asking about statistics as well? Well, most likely. The man, <laughs> loves, the man loves his stats. Okay. <laughs> so um, you've just wrapped up the crown, John. Yeah, like literally uh, two hours ago, we checked out of the, the place where everyone was yeah. staying. So new, it's actually a new post to this one, but so I haven't stuck it up. I just found a slight ledge that so might actually fall off during the interview if that, if that happens. Oh, <laughs> that'll keep that. That's the hook to keep people watching. So yeah, it's true. <laughs> just watch. You, you never. Here. Yeah, a slight gust of wind and that thing is coming down. <laughs> yeah. Well, I knew you were wrapping it up 
like within these hours because um i had spoken to hannah about coming on oh, okay uh, so she was potentially going to come on but That's then i told cool. her then i told her the time and she was like oh my flight's in about an hour from then or something like that so i was like don't worry so she will be on as i've already mentioned in the intro we're having an extra episode this week so she'll be on on thursday mm -hmm. so um which she maybe... did really well it was a, it, she did really well it was, it was great to see her did, like smash the swim event as well yeah what would you now she might hear this but anyway what would you have said was her weakness then because she did really what she actually got yeah a couple of wins yes but, but there was something that sort of pulled her back uh yeah and I, I think she knew that coming in that the strength was limited it's i think especially with strength it's very easy to have a marker as well because you know you, you look at leaderboards crossfit just uses strength in in everything so you have a very objective marker and and for her you know she doesn't have the, the numbers that some of the other athletes in her category might have yeah so i'm, I'm thinking it's a very interesting matchup that i've got on the podcast on thursday here, here you are guys spoilers for this uh, so i've got hannah on and i've also got john young coming on as yeah. well so you know crossfit analyst and lover of a heavy barbell so uh, <laughs> you know maybe who knows if, if she makes it to the games and that's why uh, i'll claim something i don't know what but i'll claim something um <laughs> but I, but i i think it's interesting and because i again i want to loop back to to a few things i've heard you talk about in the past because um obviously the program's been running for a long time now um yeah, it's close like around a decade now we've had uh, the actual company. Yeah. And I've heard you talk a bit about kind of the grassroots side of CrossFit and sort of mm. bringing up. Um, and and I mean, even I think there was even one of the, the chats on um, Coffee Pods and Wads on the like the year end wrap up kind of where they were giving giving out the sort of awards. And one of them was like best coach. And there was a bit mm. of a discussion about like what makes someone a good coach. And, and is it how many you know how many you've got in the top 10 at the games but if you went and took athletes that were already sort of in or around the top 10 and you just brought them over to your program and now they've either gone up a space or maybe just stayed at that same like maybe you're the best recruiter but you're not necessarily building people up um and obviously you you've you know you've got people up to the games but the the crown this idea of bringing in these kind of young up-and-comers uh, and then it wasn't just, it's not just like, oh, here's a competition for teens. But, you, you know, you posted about kind of having access to L1 material to kind of helping to to get them to sort of fully understand CrossFit, I suppose, and like the methodology and the training and the competition side of it and just this kind of overarching experience. I mean, is that, am I am I kind of getting the gist of the crown correct here? Is that sort of the, the, yeah. the purpose? I think we, you know, if we would sum it up, we wanted to have experience over competition. And we used the format of a competition in order to, to be able to. Now, obviously, at, at the end, there was a winner. But really, the best thing about it was all the athletes getting together, making friendships. Like, you'd have had no idea that a competition was happening just based on how they were getting on, all their interaction, what they do in the evening. You know, no one really checked the leaderboard to see what was happening. So, and that's, you know, it's obviously evolved over over the last few years, but I think that's the essence of what we want to try to get to is that you have this young group of athletes who, you know, they're already the extremely good. It's how can we set them up to have a strong future in the sport and one of the concepts is you know if they're constantly worried about trying to beat their competitors or do those things it's they're probably you know not going to have as a enjoyable time if actually they can start to realize you know we form friends with their competitors or whatever it may be and there's life outside of that that leaderboard do you think there's been a shift like away from that in the last couple of years as the sport's gotten sort of bigger um, you know, when you look back you know, years ago, it seemed like athletes were all sort of friends and, and helping each other out and just sort of, it was a bit more like, well, we're all in this together and, you know, it, it kind of it is what it is. And then as it's become a little bit more professional and more sponsors are involved and there's more opportunities when you're winning and doing well, that it's sort of that sort of friendship side of things has cooled off a little bit and people are, 
you know, obviously focus very much on their individual career. Yeah, I think so. I think it's pretty safe to say, you know, that if the sport, if there wasn't as much money involved and in that, you know, CrossFit relative to most sports is um, minimal money. But I do think it changes um, the culture and the environment. You know, if you, if you extrapolate that to another extreme, like Formula One teams or these other things, where there's huge amounts of money, you know, they're very secretive over their training methods. They're very secretive over the technology that they have and all of those things. And and I think that you know, CrossFit's a smaller scale of something like that, but more advanced than you know, like a lot of the um, the ultra races. You just get a medal at the end, whatever it may be, and they tend to have very strong communities. Um, and are very open about their training methodologies as well. Is it because the the pressures are different within the CrossFit space? I mean, the the means by which they earn money to support their participation in the sport are pretty different in CrossFit than they are in a lot of other professional level sports. Yeah, I don't. This is obviously like, like pure opinion based as well. I you know. I just feel that there was a difference to say over 10 years ago to now in terms of kind of holding information, training camps, more of a structure where information is kind of passed within within specific circles rather than just shared openly. I think, so as a, another comparison, I, I think if you watch uh, High Rocks at the moment, that's quite interesting to see. You've got Hunter, who's world number one, and he puts everything up on his YouTube. He talks about all his training, what he's doing, all of his splits. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you compare that to someone like, you know, well, most, but if we take Fraser, for example, he was very secretive. Madeiras, we again don't know very much about what he does. Jeffrey Adler, we don't have those same in-depth views as, um, as I would say, amateurs may be the wrong word, but sports who maybe haven't been around a long time. But I, I don't know the... I think money's probably a correlate, but I don't know if it's the specific reason for that happening. Mm. Do you think there's a need for the secrecy? Like, so I, I'm thinking like Matt Fraser, like famously was probably the most secretive person there ever. You know, you never saw what he was doing, but sort of then since, since he retired from competing and he got more involved in, in training people. And I can't remember if, if, uh, if this was a conversation you were having with Savan or if you, somebody else was talking about it, but they're talking about like him then applying that same sort of training to other people. And it, it's almost like, I, I kind of feel like even if Matt had just let everyone know what he was doing, I don't know how many people would have done the same thing anyway. Cause it just feels like he was, you know, he was so solely focused on doing that. And I just mm -hmm. can't, I think about other athletes that are top level athletes that I'm just like, I just don't know if they would, do what Matt did anyway. Like, okay, this is what I'm doing. But they're like, yeah, okay, that works for you. You know, and, and maybe they'd even try it for a year and just decide, I, you know, I need more balance in my life than this. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I do think you're right. You know, I don't think CrossFit, you know, because of the also the money in the sport, there's also not that technology that gets developed in the same way as other sports that maybe you'd become more secretive about mm -hmm. um, in terms of, training methodologies um and yeah I, I think what can tend to happen is someone thinks that they have a secret you know if someone discovers something about nutrition or eating this in a certain way or whatever it may be the, the latest trend and they go okay this might give me an advantage but in reality it's probably not going to as you as you just said not going to shift them to get that much more performance relative to someone else. I think within these bigger places, you know, obviously like with technology and cycling, you can get more advantages than you can uh, than something in CrossFit at the moment. Hmm. So I'm going to follow up on this line of reasoning again a little bit is, um, you know, and I mean, I've got no basis for what I'm about to say. So feel free to jump in and go, no, you're an idiot. But I would also think that, you know, let's go with Formula One again. And you're saying like the science is there in the sense of if we find it to be more efficient with, you know, fuel, that's going to be kind of a universal thing. If you apply this principle across any type of, you know, vehicle, this system that we mm. found, it will have the same result because 
it, it's just a you know a mechanical piece whereas the human body is so individual and there's so many kind of you know you could be like this will help this you know this might help you but actually you know for me i don't respond in the same way or for me yeah it helped a little bit but not i didn't have the same benefits as it did for you because you know we're just built differently so i wonder yeah. even there if there's you know or even like cycling you know a bike's a bike it's got a specific design and i assume if you make the similar adjustments to a different bike it's going to have the same kind of results whereas again people are, are very different you know especially if they've i think especially within maybe it's a little bit different now that people are coming up within crossfit but especially a few years ago when you came into crossfit from years of doing another sport you know depending on your sporting background would even be you know change the kind of athlete you are so so in so uh, interesting take cycling again we were actually discussing this with um one of our coaches chris the, the other day there was a german cyclist um very famous and the story was about something different he actually admitted to doping it was in the era of lance armstrong when everyone was doping but actually there was a uh, something interesting regarding this point and that was that when they were training they wouldn't eat so they would go for rides. They just didn't feel that nutrition on the bike was important. So the only thing they would do was drink water. They would cycle hundreds of kilometers just drinking water. Whereas now, you know, there's a huge base of evidence that obviously that is the most, not the most optimal way to train. And so that information obviously started. They obviously came up with this idea or this theory that you don't need to uh, fuel yourself when on the bike then over the years it's advanced to actually the nutrition on the bike becoming quite um specific and, and obviously very important and that kind of thing can give you a bit of advantage and i would also say that in crossfit i think that the training methodologies have advanced um a bit as well like if you look back in the day you know just on the games 2011 or whatever it may be and see how people were moving see the kind of workouts and training programs that they were doing i think it's like uh, i think you could see a significant difference to like you know however long that is the last 15 years or 14 years um to now so i i, I yes i think that there is knowledge that gets passed passed around that does become useful but I, you know, I don't know if one specific training camp or thing has a specific secret that is going to enhance the athletes in a way that it can't be openly shared. Yeah. Mm. I wonder if the secrecy is just a matter of remaining focused. You know, like if if you're constantly having to churn out content that talks about the type of training that you're doing, that's a, it's potentially a distraction from the training that you're already trying to do. So, you know, I, I can see where some athletes would just, you know, put their head down and just work on the training that they think is going to get them to the next level and not necessarily share unless there's a compelling reason to do so. And that's where this sport is a little bit different where the, the sponsors expect content. And so that that relationship winds up having to be nurtured with regular posts, but is it focused on training specifically, or is it, other content that they benefit from yeah it's a good question maybe they need to get sponsors that they don't actually use and then they keep posting <laughs> promoting promoting that stuff and then everyone's going oh that's the secret that's the secret and it's not helping them at all <laughs> like if i if i look at it from our we obviously had a training camp where we we work with athletes and you know we don't want to give out advantage to our competitors that we feel we have there are certain principles that we work with um and we hold those not, not necessarily tightly it's like something that we're open about but we feel that our method works otherwise we wouldn't be using it or looking for other things and we don't necessarily go around and and promote it, but we're not necessarily holding it tight and, and secretive about it. Right. Oh, sorry, the question's just come in. Let's see what, what we've here. John, as crown organizer, Craig Lynch is declining open participation in the teams yeah. division. Why? Oof, Oofs is actually a bit of a legend. He really helped us in the uh, lane eight um, scenario at, oh, yes. uh, during semis last year. I. 
I really think it just comes down to you know, ultimately the things aren't being well optimally managed. You know, I think that media needs to be better, and I think that that would start to inspire the next generation. You know, the, the content around the current winners, the content around all the teams at the games, I just don't think it's at a level that inspires people to come in, new people to come in and do the open, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, you get just a knock-on effect of, you know, be it declining specifically in the teams. I, you know, also, I know they say that it's growing on from 2020, the open participation, but really, we've not seen like the 2018 numbers, 2017 numbers, I think that this year was around the same as 2015, 16. So we still haven't generated the kind of momentum that was seen back then. And therefore, I think it's participation is not what it could be. Do you think there's any correlation to the decision to make the teen competition, you know, now be at pit as opposed to being at the games? Where, so you know, potentially somebody was thinking, well, this was my opportunity to, to go to the games. And now maybe I'd rather focus on my training because I'd rather go to, you know, this in-person competition that's going to be, because I'm, I'm just thinking of athletes, you know, especially in this side of the world where they're the amount of money they have to spend just to travel to get there. And it's like, if you were doing that for the games, maybe, but if you're doing that for pit, it's like, yeah, it's technically our games, but maybe it just doesn't carry the same prestige you know, you've got to explain to somebody. Oh, so you won it. So you won the game. Well, well, yeah, it, it's the it's you know it's our version of the games. Whereas maybe they're thinking, you know what? Let me use the teen years to get a bit more in person experience. Focus on those competitions, and then you know make a run for the games when I'm you know eligible or older to actually go to the games if I can make mm -hmm. it there. I don't know. Maybe not. I think it could be. You know, you hear about it in the Masters as well. I don't know how like. I don't don't know just how much of a significant impact that has in regards to actual numbers signing up. And I actually think it was a sensible decision in the long run because I think you'll be able to do a better job with the, the divisions. Maybe it does have some impact. I, I do think there's something special about the athletes being around the, the best in the world that did appeal them, uh, appeal to them going. Mm. Yeah, I don't know that as well because I, I'm i thinking about people I have seen that signed up for the Open and they are the potential people that could, ma you know, could make it to the next stages, could even make it to the games. Um, and it's probably the people that aren't signing up aren't necessarily the people that were anyway thinking they would make it to the games. They're, they're probably, you know, a little bit further down the, uh, the rankings at the moment. Um, so it's, yeah, it's probably more to do with if it's being, you know, it's very hard for me because, you know, I'm I'm a CrossFit buff and the Open was very mm -hmm. highly promoted, very high, you know, we had a, a huge participation within the box. There was, you know, you know, a little competition running between sort of four teams that had been assembled within the box as well. So there was a lot going on. And then I look at, you know, you're hearing of other people like, well, I'll do the Opens, but I'm, I'll do the workouts, but I'm not signing up or, oh, you know, we're not. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, for me, it's quite hard because I'm like, oh, yeah, I've always you know, I've always been somewhere where the Open was so highly promoted from within that I don't know Cross what it's like in other in other boxes. I think CrossFit Bath, you know, they like a completely OG box um, that have been around uh, such a long time. Is it Adam is uh, Adam and Ollie, no, still the do they still own the box yeah. through there? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, so they've been around. I mean, I think I competed with Adam, like you know, like long long time ago so it's uh i think if you've come up with that history and that media you're more inclined to then keep promoting it because you have that feeling of remembering what it was however you know since 2018 without a proper media team there's not been that same hype created around it yeah hmm. yeah and there's been a lot of other pressures on the affiliates themselves to see a change in the composition of their membership overall and, and the overall level of interest in CrossFit in general. So I don't know if we answered Ulf's question or not, but there we go. We've, we've, we've talked about <laughs> it. We've talked about it at least. <laughs> Barkley's got an interesting question as well. 
there have sort of been four eras of CrossFit. Let's call them the pre-Froning, Froning, Fraser, and post-Fraser. What do you guys think the next era will look like? I would love to know. And I think, I, I feel like we are, you know, I, I think there's a pretty good summary of the the eras that we have had. And I think that the next era has to look very different because of all the changes that are going on. But I, you know, I'd love to know what direction and what that's going to look like. But um, unfortunately, I have no idea. So I'm intrigued if the like the throwing. So we've got pre throwing, throwing, and Fraser. And and I mean, obviously, the throwing era was sort of while he was the goat and he was just winning everything. The Fraser era, the same, but for Fraser. I'm guessing pre-throning is the kind of the fact that it was a bit raw, but there was also a change between kind of who was leading, who was winning. Mm. Um, and we're sort of back in that in the sense, you know, we had Justin do it twice. Now we had Jeff do it. Um, Jeff Adler, I really hope to get him on the podcast soon. Um, people make it happen. Keep send him this clip that I'm about to say. I think, <laughs> I think Jeff is an incredible athlete. I think he's, got one of the best sort of runs to make it to the games and to win the games when you look at someone that kind of went back and just changed the type of athlete they were and then made it to the games and and and, you know winning the games and i feel so sorry for him because you know matt never beat rich uh justin never beat matt so every time we've had a champion, it's always been like, oh, yeah, but, you know, they never, well, technically, you know, Matt never actually beat Rich. And, oh, oh well, you know, Justin never actually beat Matt. Mm. Jeff beat Justin. He's like the first games champion we've had in ages that actually beat the previous games champion. And it's just, yeah, but Krennikov would have won if he hadn't got injured. I'm like, well, I don't know that. I'm, uh, I'm not sure that's true. I'm, you know, it's not like that. One, he'd already done really well to be in the position he was in when, you know, Roman hurt himself. And, and I just feel like it's, you know, for, for, for like, for Matt, he was never going to have the opportunity to beat Rich after Rich went team. Justin was never going to have the opportunity to beat Matt because he retired. Finally, we get a champion who actually dethrones someone and we're still not happy. We're still not convinced he's really the <laughs> champion. So, um, yeah, anyway, just a thought, just a thought. But I, yeah, I assume we're going to have um, we're going to shift into maybe you know will Jeff oh well can can Jeff Adler hold it can he win two in a row right, can he repeat yeah well Canada has been doing extremely well in the last few years I mean and that's that's I think the icing on the cake there is that even if you went and grabbed someone at a box and said name a a, a CrossFit Games athlete from Canada they're probably going to pick Velna or Fakowski before Adler despite the fact that he's won the games. Right. Oh, there's no justice for Jeff. That's what we've got to get trending now. I feel so bad for this guy. <laughs> yeah, but I, I also think it's the same. I I don't think it's the current winners like Madeiras, for example. I don't think had much exposure on him. I don't think Laura's had her fair share of exposure. I, I just think it is, it, I think if you, a lot of these things are open participation and whatnot. And, you know, obviously the the media teams of Coffee Wards and Pods, Savan, Baba, Spin, all those guys have have mentioned it. There's no because there's no CrossFit media. How do you even really know what's happening unless you directly follow the the competition? Yeah, yeah, and and I mean even yeah, I mean even the media is being made. You know, as you mentioned by other people. But CrossFit even seem reticent to share that or to kind of, you know, like, okay, we didn't make a video on this person. Sorry. But, oh, they went on this podcast. We could at least, you know, direct the massive amount of followers we have over there and say, well, look, you know, the the games champ, he was here. He did this thing. But they don't even seem to do that. And that, you know, that's minimal effort. That really requires very little on their part just to tag someone in in a post. But anyway... Yeah, and there have been great stories. I, I spoke about this on, with Savannah about Jeffrey Adler, but actually another Canadian athlete with Emma Lawson, like right? phenomenal athlete. But really, we know very little about Emma Lawson. You know, there's there's really no 
storyline. Obviously, you can follow her on Instagram, whatever it may be, but it, it's not the same as it was with Froning. I mean, Fraser also had, he did very well with his own documentaries and stuff, but CrossFit also did stuff on Fraser. And, you know, I think that I personally, a lot of the fan base, and I'd love to see stuff on Jeffrey Adler, to see CrossFit do stuff on Laura. And I think it, the thought process, I think, is it has to be central. It's really hard when they have their own channels because it, the storyline is a bit all over the place. And I think there has to be this one central point, which you know, should be CrossFit, that tells the story of lots of people. Yeah. But also because I, I don't really want to see... I don't want to go to their YouTube channel to hear them talk about themselves because it's all curated. I can't necessarily, you know, I, I want to see kind of like the behind the scenes that Savan put out was great because you got to see the athletes, you know, not like exposed in a bad way, but you just got to see them a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more kind of caught off guard at times, not, not, really prepared necessarily for the question that was going to come or for what happened. Whereas anything they're putting up on their YouTube, you know, they've approved it. They've looked at it. They've made sure it's, you know, the best thing for them, yeah. which, which is fine, but it, it, it feels a bit clinical. It doesn't feel natural and it doesn't draw you to them in the same way. You know, you don't see that. Oh, look, we're all human. We all make mistakes or we, you know, Oh, they reacted the same way I would have reacted in that situation. You just yeah. see sort of like highlight reels and that's it really. It's different when there's, there's, uh, you know, one cinema. I mean, granted there might be a team even within the, the CrossFit media team, but there's, there's a viewpoint, a perspective that comes from that centralization of how that content is created that is missing when each of the camps goes out and creates their own content. There's just, there's no way to compare them to one another in the same way as when you watch Savon do an interview with 10 different athletes and he won't ask the same question, but you kind of get little inklings of the, the perspective, the, the home base where those questions are coming from is common. And so it gives people a bit of a better insight into who those athletes are and what they care about. And you just, you can't get that if they're out creating their own content. I actually think that's, that's a really good point. It's the, it's the consistency between, you know, there's this one consistent source and that makes it a lot easier for you to have this baseline of which then to understand all the different athletes. Yeah. Puts the, the emphasis on you, Jason, to get them all on the podcast. That it does. <laughs> right. <laughs> no pressure. Um, hey, I'm, I'm happy to have everyone on here. They're less happy to come on here. Let's, let's, uh, let's be clear about that. Uh, but, you know, maybe John will put in a good word with some of his athletes and get them on for me, and that'd be nice. Yeah, I think it's good. And, and I still, uh, the hard thing, I think, as well, is this... Even despite all the work that the external media teams do, and they are doing a great job, we wouldn't have as much content as we did. Unless it comes from like HQ or the base, it's, it's not going to have the same effect. Yeah. And then, I mean, you know, we've mentioned like Savannah's behind the scenes. So it's one of the, it's probably the best bit of CrossFit content that has come out in the last, you know, however many years with regards to the games specifically. I mean, he's also made some great stuff, you know, around the open and things like that. But talking about the games, we've got that. How many people will not have watched it because they don't like Savan and they don't like his podcast and they don't like maybe the kind of questions he asks some people on his podcast or they've, you know, they've taken one clip, they've been sent out of context, or whatever it may be. And so because it's Savan, they will not watch it. Whereas if Savan had made it, for CrossFit and CrossFit had packaged it and put it out, they'd all have gone and watched it. Like, oh, it's from CrossFit. Let's go and watch this. And they wouldn't have even necessarily looked at who was behind the camera or who was doing it. Um, so I think that's the other element, isn't it? It's sort of, mm. oh, CrossFit put this out. I can go there. I can watch it. It's from CrossFit. They approve of it. It must be fine. Versus, oh, it's this independent person. And for whatever reason, I don't necessarily like them. And therefore, I'm not going to watch you know, a, a good piece of media that would promote some of my favorite athletes, but I won't even give it a chance be, because of a, you know, a personal bias. -y. Though I did hear, um, I think it might be on days we can review or maybe his, uh, one of his interviews with Savan that they are going to do a documentary on last year's games. Yeah. Oh, nice. So at least that's, that's kind of something moving forward in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, they've got to see the result, like, I mean, it was huge. People loved it. And at a certain point, you've got to just go like, well, 
this is what people are responding to. Let's pivot. I mean, they do it with with other stuff. Like, you know, they post Instagram reels that are just sort of following, you know, TikTok trends and stuff like that. And it's, which I hate, to be honest, that kind of thing. But, <laughs> but like, they'll do that. So they'll, they'll take kind of a measure of, oh, what are people responding to on social media at the moment? Oh, yeah, let's do our version. Right. So at a certain point, you've got to say, look, if you see this is getting traction, you've got to embrace it. You've got to lean in. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, um, Peter's, uh, you know, the fake news. It's like you can either kind of resist it and be like, oh, I can't believe you meant, or lean into it and just sort of realize that, hey, it's exposure. It's, you know, I might look a bit silly in this thing, but it's exposure is good for me. And, and you just lean I mean, into it. As an organization, I'm sure they have a sense of what they want their voice to be. But if, if that isn't coming out of them, then... Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it means that the other channels are the only source of information that we have access to, and it doesn't necessarily speak with the same voice. So as a result, they're having to be more selective about what they wind up reposting or, or promoting, because it it may not necessarily be a true reflection of what they want to say about the sport and or about the methodology. At some point, they may wind up having to start pumping real content out themselves in order to ensure that that voice is reflected correctly. Which is fine. I'm happy for them to do that. If, yeah. if they do that, but they have to do that. Um, so Ulf said, uh, true, a bit confusing that athlete content runs on various social media channels. Yeah. Barkley saying at least three people. I'm assuming that's still in relation to that unless I've missed something. But then Ulf asked, does the sport of CrossFit a season with more elite competitions that count for something like formula one race atp tournament etc um, i think i've heard you speak about this before john about the idea of having a a longer running season yeah like you know i'm i've definitely put my uh like hat in the ring or whatever the expression is like i'm i think it's ridiculous that we don't have a, a longer official season and i think that it just leaves so many dips in the year where you know, no one's talking about CrossFit. Nothing's related to the games. Then all of a sudden, it's like bam! Every no. As I have said before, I find it crazy that, like, during European regionals, I have made twenty-four athletes or whatever the number that we get is, all qualify on one weekend. And I think it's really sad because you can't tell any of their stories with that many people, that volume of people uh, all qualifying. So you know, if you space that across a year really tell stories create hype for the athletes that go through have you know, consistent news about the sports i i really struggle to see why it would be dis I, I don't see the disadvantage and that's you know throughout conversations i mean i'd be really interested to like poke holes into why this wouldn't work so th this is what lost me a lot of points when I was on around the whiteboard, but um, I also think that. So you know, the, we were discussing about like cuts at the games and you know if, if events had been positioned differently, would it have changed the outcome of the games and things like that? And I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's an impossible hypothetical to discuss because a person that won an event on you know Saturday. They might not have won that same event on Sunday because maybe a, an event between those two, you know, taxed them in a certain way that they weren't, they wouldn't have performed as well. So as soon as you start moving mm -hmm. things around, it's very difficult. But my reasoning on about the cuts at the games is maybe just take less people to the games in the first place, but really make the, you know, the, the semifinals big spectacles. Because I was like, if you won the European Championship in another sport, that's a big deal. But like if you are the best in all of Europe in this sport, that's really impressive. Whereas for us, it's like, oh, yeah, they, you know, oh, they won semifinals. Yeah, okay. But this person was also at semifinals and, you know, they're probably going to do better than them at the games. And maybe they weren't, you know, they hadn't really peaked, peaked for semifinals because they're saving themselves a bit for the game. It's kind of like, ah. Whereas I think if you could make, you know, and, and then you could, as you say, you know, like space them out throughout and be like, okay, this weekend there's the European you know, semi-final, the, I'd give it a different name, not European Championships that's taken, but, you know, there's this big event and then the top five at this event are going to go to the games and this is going to be this huge thing and you really make that a spectacle. And then, if, you know, a week later or a few weeks later, you've got, oh, now we're holding 
one in North America and it's going to be a huge thing. And it, and then you take just a few to the games and it's sort of like, you know, it, it's it puts suddenly it's more important to look at, you know, maybe it's just top three from each of these events. It's just the podium that progress onto the games or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. Isn't that one of the things that complicates the feeder system to the games, though, is that if the games is the singular event for the season and qualifying is scattered throughout the year, how like obviously those athletes will have to peak at different times relative to their appearance at the game. So it could that be a disincentive to have this centralization on the games being the season finisher or should it be like some other professional sports where there are multiple high level competitions that are considered the penultimate. There's not a singular uh, event that caps the season. So I, I had you know, some thoughts on that. One, I think on that first point is that I really do think the order of the events makes a significant difference when you change the point system, because, you know, you're not just talking about like athletes being tired, doing the same thing. What tends to happen is it tends to be biased to weightlifting, conditioning or gymnastics. And so if you put a bias on the last day of gymnastics, it's going to hugely favor the type of athlete that's better at gymnastics. And then one of, one of the hard things you go, okay, well, why is that unfair or not fair? And it, it's neither because there's no definition that really fits into what is good programming for the CrossFit Games. Hmm. You know, you have this big thing. Okay, it's constantly varied movements, execute high intensity. Or you know, you've got this hugely broad definition of what can fit in there, and therefore it makes it really hard because you go, "What is the gold standard programming for the CrossFit Games?" And I don't think really there's any answer. A question I've put out a few times is, which is the best year's programming to find the fittest on earth of the CrossFit Games? You know, is there a CrossFit Games that is better programmed to find the fittest on earth and why as like a starting point? Right. And, and I kind of feel there should be a better and a worse year. You know, like one year actually is maybe biased to a certain thing and, and therefore within this, a kind of constantly varied idea that actually it's not, um, you know, it, it wasn't the best programmed year. But again, you, you can't have these discussions or we have, I've never had these discussions with the people who organize and, and can change that. Right. Um, and then I think in regards to the, the other question I, about like having multiple events, I think it's like in like in golf, for example, you have the Masters or whatever it may be. But there's just been so many years, like the history of the sport is so intertwined with the CrossFit Games that I think that having this pinnacle event and this this like showcase um, could could still work, and the other events would you know feed in. The, the games would be like this the final thing that completes the season that the top 20 in the world want to go to, as you mentioned, I don't think the cut system within the competition is a good idea and therefore just take 20 athletes and really showcase them is probably more sensible. And, you know, you've got then multiple opportunities throughout the year to qualify. And if you qualify, whatever it is in September, you've almost got a year to prepare. Whereas if you qualify in July, you've only got a month, but ultimately it mm. then becomes the athlete's choice of if they wear, you know, okay, I want to wait till July to like qualify or actually I want to try and qualify as early as possible so then I can just train and peak or go to different competitions. Right now, the athletes have zero autonomy and option in that. They go, okay, I've got one competition, one opportunity. That's it. I've got to make it through. Yeah. Did you like... It the... back to when they had sanctionals where they could pick where they wanted to go to qualify so they can control their, their peaking based on what competition they want to attend. Yeah, I, I, I can't see why, again, why would you not have that system in place? I I also think that the argument becomes of this, like, dictating things by citizenship. It just creates all these weird scenarios where, you know, someone's got a double passport from a country they've never lived in, so they can then go and compete in that country. Mm. But the whole point of doing this citizenship thing was to try and, like up the level or, or give opportunities to people within those countries. But ironically with this system, you don't necessarily do that because of this people having 
two passports or whatever it may be. And I also think that we've had examples in the past where it was where you were living. And the fact that athletes, top athletes, moved over to those regions did was nothing but good for the competitiveness of that area. It brought exposure. It got a lot of interest. It got more athletes involved. And I don't, I, I really don't believe that it was negative towards the people who were already living there. In fact, I, I think it brought more positive than the negative. Mm. Yeah. And I, so I was going to ask, and then Sean jumped in with it. Of like, did you like the sanctional format? Because I, I did like that. I think there were some unnecessary things that made it complicated because of sort of backfilling spots because oh actually this person had qualified over here in a different manner and it, it was you know people were a bit confused by why the person that came fifth in this competition got a spot to the games and that was again just right. maybe because things weren't always clearly kind of put out by crossfit going into these events but in a similar thing yeah if like okay we're gonna hold you know they, they were holding them in china weren't they? like pandaland yeah. ones like that and it was it meant that it wasn't necessary athletes that were living out there but you mm. could choose to travel out there and you know what a great opportunity if i'm a crossfitter living in that country and i'm thinking well i'm never going to go to the games i'm never going to get to see you know these athletes but oh two of them are coming for this sanctional event and i'm actually going to get to go and watch them in person and it just yeah drums up kind of enthusiasm within the community i mean that was a similar thing we found uh, you know in december at fit fest having these athletes come over and there were so many people that went to watch them because they, they just knew they were never going to see you know these athletes in person sort of again probably until we found out that rogue is coming uh, to scotland and so maybe we will uh but I, I i think that was a good you know i enjoyed that the the citizenship thing it always makes me laugh when it rolls around every year because uh, like we signed up for the open so my wife signed up for the open and then she's always like, oh why like why have i got the you know because she's from the philippines originally so she's still when she signs up, she and I'm like, well, you know, if you ever made it to to semifinals, you've got to go. She <laughs> ha hasn't been back to the Philippines in 20 years. You know, she left when she was what, like 14, maybe. And then her family will move to Italy and then was in Italy for years. And now she's been in England for the last like eight years or whatever. Mm -hmm. But letter of the law, if she qualified to to make it to a, a semifinal, she's got to go and compete in, in Asia, which is. Oh you know it, it's just it, crazy really yeah well I, I think that in, you know obviously in some cases they allow the the exemption yes but the i think it's more actually where it's the opposite that actually if she if she had the opportunity to then go to a weaker region yes. and take advantage of that then that's where things actually get a, um, a bit stranger because you can then you know have presumably the advantages of training in a place that has more advanced crossfit or whatever it may be mm. and then take it to a place that you know they're giving the opportunity to because they don't have that level of exposure or level or whatever it may be there are certainly pros and cons that would have to be balanced in i mean they gave some thought to that when sanctionals were in place and and some of the effort in moving the way that they did was to level the playing field in having common programming particularly most recently but there is that that sense of that there's an advantage that's given to athletes that have the ability to travel, potentially even to more than one. If they don't make the games by attending event A, then they go to event B and subsequently qualify. Or they pick a place where the strength of field is not the same as where they commonly train. So there's still some balancing, I'm sure, that they would wind up having to do to ensure that it's as fair as possible. I, I just think when that... When you start going into that fairness equation, it gets very tricky. And uh, because you, when you try and control the fairness in that way, hmm. it gets really confusing because you then find all these weird rules or people who fit in in a slightly different way. And I really don't see why you don't just have the 20 fittest. Because right now, you don't necessarily have the 40 fittest athletes at the CrossFit Games because of the way you do this structure. So because these athletes haven't competed against each other, you will have regions that have fitter people than other regions, not at the CrossFit Games. True. So that, therefore, you don't have the 40, what, 40 fits male, 40 fits female at the CrossFit Games. That's just you know, it's a fact based on the way they've done their system. So I don't know why you wouldn't want the fittest athletes at the CrossFit Games, 
and therefore open it up in this way that allows athletes to travel around, go around. And, and I think you need the fairness in competition, obviously. But I, mm. I, I do believe, and we see this, that if someone from a, you know, who has a you know, not as not financially strong backgrounds, so they can't afford to go to places, they actually tend to get a lot of support from their country to be the first athlete to go to the country from sponsors who'd love to see their athlete go. Um, and, and support that travel and support that person going. So yeah, it's just my, my kind of point of view on that is that I, I think you should allow the, the fittest athletes to be at the CrossFit Games um, and give them the opportunity to have the choice of where they go to compete. Yeah. And I think, um, like, as it, you know, if you start looking at this kind of, well, it's not fair because they've got more money to travel. Like, at what point do we end this discussion because then you're like well it, then it's also not fair that they can train full time because of the sponsorship they've got or the the money coming into it so already right. that's not fair this other athlete is also working and they can only train when they're not working so well that's not fair should we give them an advantage going into the competition to kind of you know like, like a handicap for the other it will never end if you start sparring that. but again if you say well look the, the the sense it's fair in the sense that everyone has the same opportunity to compete and try and get to the games if you can get there, great. If you can't get there, you know, that's the, the fairness begins at three, two, one, go. And that's when it begins. But before that, we can't control external factors. Um, it does seem the more rules that they try to put on, the more kind of, you know, as we said, with the citizenship, with things like that, it just, it just overcomplicates things. And then it doesn't actually necessarily result in what you want and it just results in people being you know unhappy about why did this athlete get an exemption and this one didn't why is this athlete competing in this country when they've never even been there why is you know there's so many mm -hmm. whereas if you just said look there's these you know 15 competitions that will be running through the year uh, oh but it's not fair i qualified closer to the games i didn't have as much time to train uh, you should have gone to the earlier one. Oh, but i couldn't beat the person at the earlier one what's well, your problem that's not it's not our problem the opportunity was there a fitter athlete went and get it. they're probably going to do better at the games as well. So don't worry about it. Yeah. It's not, if you'd had those extra six months of training, they probably still would have beaten you. So it's fine. Go and qualify towards the end and get in. Um, but anyway. and, and also your example of Pandaland when they had the sanction events, you know, we, we had athletes that traveled over there as well. And, and all of a sudden, even in this short window, because the pure reason they would have never have gone for any other reason that it gave the opportunity to qualify for the CrossFit Games. And because that was there, you've got this huge flow of athletes who traveling from Australia, going to Europe, from Europe to America, from America, all around. And all of a sudden, this everyone who's usually been kind of within their own bubble started to move around and, and travel. And I believe that was very good for the ecosystem in general. Mm. And I would think that actually, when you look at like the way regions are made up, so in some parts of the world, it's actually going to be kind of almost a bigger financial hit for an athlete to travel to their, you know, their semi-final that is in another part of, you know, technically their region, but just because they're in a country that, you know, maybe is, uh, you know, the economy is not as good as it is in other parts of the world meaning that even though relative to like flying to this place from america it's cheaper for them it's still a bigger kind of turnover a bigger payout that they're having to make and actually for an athlete flying from america they're like well i've got the money to do it and i can afford to do it and it's you know it's no big deal so it's not even that it's necessarily made things super easy for the athletes in those regions it's just it's again it's just this veneer this perception that it's fair and that it's giving all these countries an opportunity and we're going to get, you know, the fittest from all over the world. Whereas actually, you know, as, as John said, we'll, we'll get the fittest will be there. And then some of the very fit, but not necessarily the fittest will also be, will be there as well. Um, mm. But yeah, anyway, it's, I mean, we can fix it, but CrossFit just don't want to let us do it. I don't know. I don't know what the problem <laughs> is. Um, uh, one final line of reasoning we've had here. Uh, how does CrossFit cross the divide into mainstream media? Does CrossFit have college league? Well, it doesn't have college league, does it? But I guess it's the same thing, isn't it? Like if you've got stuff going on all through the year, that's opportunities to broadcast things throughout the year. You can follow a season that is longer than, you know, little bursts like we have at the moment. You know, oh, the Open, oh, great. Mm -hmm. Oh, quarterfinals, oh, semifinals, games, done. 
and it's sort of yeah drip feeding it throughout the year uh, but there i guess it's similar to like what i guess it's exactly the same thing isn't it why is an athlete willing to travel to china because of games tickets on the line why is a spectator willing to watch an event in china it's because there's a games ticket on the line it's sort of there has to be that carrot to, to justify you know wh why do i care who wins this event well i care because now i know who's going to the game and i mean even it gives you great stuff to speculate you know oh this athlete got there but they got there through this competition so what does that mean how's that gonna relate to their performance at the games you know is yeah there's a lot you could spec uh, anyway i liked sanctionals i know people hated it but i really did enjoy it <laughs> i also think it was just really messy at that time you had like two opens you had the fittest in each country going it was just yeah it, it never really got its its time to shine with that system it was just everything was just super messy around that time yeah i and i think there is a way you could I mean, I think there's still a way you can make the Open work. I think you sh I've said it before as well, that I think you just say, okay, if you win the Open, that's the first games ticket. So win the Open, there's your ticket to the games, and that's, you know, and, and that's why. And then maybe the Open gives you, like, a ranking system for these other events. Like, you can, perhaps you can only, you can only go to these events if you're at least a certain, you know, cutoff in the Open. That's what enables. So you can't just come from outside CrossFit and be like, "Well, I'm just going to jump in and try and." So, although someone coming from outside CrossFit and snagging a ticket to the games does sound um, <laughs> does sound like a spectacle. Could be interesting. Yeah, and I think the you know some of these specifics are things that would have to be worked out. You know, like does does everyone need to do the open? Uh, do you need still need to have an open um, in in terms of for qualifying for the CrossFit yeah. games? I think it's a great community event and and, and something that I love doing. The big question becomes, does it need to be a qualification process for the CrossFit Games? Is it relevant in that way? You know, Does each competition then need to have its separate qualifying? Does it mean that you know if you make top 20 in the Games, then you get a buy into the next year for the, for the events? It's like, there's loads of these specific details that you know, I think you can start going down lots of rabbit holes with. But I think actually it's a bigger picture idea of like, the season needs to be lengthened. That's probably where okay, we go. Okay, we can all agree on that. How do we then yeah. create something that works in that? Yeah, that also doesn't destroy the athletes before they get to the games because they've been because this is that this is always mm. the kind of fallback. Oh, but we can't have them competing all through the year. It's too intense. You know, they'll be dead by the end. And it's like, well, again, if you can do it in a way that it's strategic, that it allows people to to be on at certain times and you know, there's something to watch, but it's not the same athlete, yeah, competing every single month at high intensity that would be, yeah, quite crazy. And, and, and this is another discussion. It's like, how do you define a, a well-programmed event? And it's, you know, does it need to have, does it need to be three days long and a beat down? Or actually, can you, can you identify the fittest from a competition in one day? Is one day sufficient enough to be able to do that? Like, I think semifinals volume, with six events, it's, it's not such a, a beat down for the athletes relative to something like Games or Rogue or Dubai or those bigger events. Hmm. And I think if you're, again, looking at it as like, how can we draw people in? How can we broadcast this? How can we make more people, you know, fans of the sport and then potentially from fans of the sport walk into an affiliate and start training themselves? The longer the, you're running the events, the harder it is for people to follow just because of time. You know, if it's like a yeah. four-day event, oh, now I need to block out four days to to watch this, and my family are, you know, screaming at me from the other room, why are you still on YouTube kind of thing. It's Whereas if it's a weekend, it's a little bit easier. And and you you can skip things anyway, can't you? Because, you know, there's always big gaps between events, so you can kind of condense it into a manageable a manageable chunk to watch. And uh, your That's got to be at least part of the angry. strategy that CrossFit is using with their engagement with quote-unquote mainstream media for the last day or two of the games there's certainly i mean the, the you know whether it's espn or cbs none of them are going to just automatically jump to cover the entire uh four or five days of the games they'll wait until there's a race to to really show um so but i expect that if they continue to have that kind of partnership 
maybe that's where things will grow. I mean, it's it's going to come down to numbers. They're going to know whether or not people are actually watching, whether they're responding. And, you know, I mean, it's just a matter of whether or not they're getting the eyeballs that they're expecting by broadcasting this lesser known sport. I'd love to know what feedback they would get from like ESPN. Like if they're saying, well, look, the numbers are tracking like this. You get really good engagement, you know, for the first X amount of time and then it sort of drops off. So what, you know, what would be better is if you could space that out throughout the year and have these short and, and, you know, I mean, as right. much as people complain about kind of, oh, CrossFit, you know, money grab this or, you know, think about the online or these people that have come in. But if the feedback you started getting was actually, hey, this gets more engagement, which earns more money. Like there could be a win-win sort of scenario there that, oh, realizing we get more numbers, which earns us more money if we do it this way, actually then benefits the season, which then more people watching gets you know, more people involved anyway. I don't know. I don't know. Who, who knows? Yeah. And I think it's also hard that there's no long-term like structural plan. Like no one has any idea what's happening next year. So, you know, what, like there's, there's very hard to, to plan and program around that. You know, we're already, we, we probably won't know. We're, like we're April already. We probably won't know until like September. I, I can't even remember when we found out that everything was moving to Texas and yeah. that there weren't going to be age groups. And it was like September, October or something like that. Mm -hmm. So not having like a three or five year plan also opens up all these questions. I think if CrossFit said, came in and said, okay, well, you know what, guys, we're just going to do open quarterfinals, semifinals games, like like it or leave it. That's the plan for the next five years. I also think that would take away these discussions because then you don't have a choice. You're like, okay, well, this is what I've got to do. It's what CrossFit has said, so let's do it. Whereas right now, you can go, well, let's have all these discussions because actually there doesn't, there's, there doesn't feel like there's a projection for the next five years. There's an awful lot of unknowns that training camps, athletes, everybody associated with CrossFit has to contend with, uh, at least in the current climate. Yeah, very much. But, you know, hey, it's good for us because we get to have these discussions. So I get to invite John and John and, uh, <laughs> and chat about these things. Um, so... I, I guess it's you know it's been a it's been a good hour and so oh, more than an hour. So I always say I'm going to keep these short and then they run longer and longer, but it's fine. Um, John, John Singleton, that's a job. I'm looking at you, but you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> John, um, so obviously you've got a number of athletes sort of in your camp this year that are probably going to be making a, a good good run for the games. Uh, anyone that we should be keeping a, a special eye on? I mean, all of them, obviously, um, but. I think we'll definitely give a shout out to Luca, Luca Vunyak. He, um, he finished fourth in the Open. He's been on the fringe of qualifying uh, for the last few years. He's he's a hard worker. So he, he's an athlete that I would like to see get his time at the Games. I think that'd be a real nice one for him to be able to qualify. Excellent. Okay, so everybody quickly go and uh, give him a follow track his progress this year let's get him the, the little bump he needs to to get to the games um and then is, is there anything else we should be looking out for from the program or i mean obviously the crown is just wrapped up uh, what's the it, next thing for you we are you know heads down into the season we obviously have our staple athletes we have moritz who's looking to punch his way back ella joined a team this year so We've kind of partnered with a with a team that's hoping to make it through. So there's a, a, a few little things uh, happening, but you know, just uh, it, it kind of excited to have the quick splash that is semis and, and then jump into the the games. Excellent, and uh, people can obviously go and follow the program, and they can follow uh, John Christian Singleton on uh, on Instagram and see what you guys are up to. Uh, Jean Saint Amand. Um, You've got the Box Jumper podcast. You just recently put out an episode with some 70 plus yeah. uh, athletes. I want to say athletes. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, they they laughingly say athletes as well when, when I talk to them about it. But I, I keep emphasizing to them they are in the midst of athletic training, despite the fact that both are well into their 70s and, um, you know, just moving phenomenally well, not just for their age, but for somebody 20 years younger. Um, you know, it's, it's incredible what the methodology can do for someone at, even at that age. And they started fairly late. Um, Linda started when she was 70. I think Faye might've started in her late sixties. 
Um, so, you know, like the longevity that it's providing is fantastic. So I was really eager to talk to them and, and they were uh, reticent at first, but very generously sat down with me and decided to talk about their experience. Excellent. So you, people can follow you at, uh, was it uh, Box Jumper at 40? Box Jumper over four zero. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at over four zero. Uh, or they can find uh, the Box Jumper podcast. Uh, you've got the nice branding in the screen there as well. So they're probably yes. been looking uh, at that you. for the last hour. <laughs> uh, lots of good episodes on there. You can skip the one that I'm on. Feel free to just overlook that one. Uh, but there's not at all. Really great stuff. Go back and listen to Jason share uh, nuggets about how he got started. Yeah, but nobody needs to know. <laughs> know all of that um well thank you both very much for coming on i've really appreciated you uh, giving me this little bit of time uh, as i've already mentioned we'll be back on thursday that will be 7 p.m uh, uk time which is uh, 1 p.m central uh, 11 a.m pacific 2 p.m eastern and it's just 5 a.m in sydney so if you're in australia and you want to join us that'd be great uh, and as i said a very interesting matchup so fresh off competing at the crown we're going to be having uh, hannah went and then joining us is also crossfit analyst and lover of a heavy barbell john young so hopefully you can join us for that as well so thank you once again guys uh, thank you everyone that left uh, interesting questions in the comments as well appreciate you making my job easier and uh, hopefully you'll see people again on thursday Thanks, Jason. Great to connect, John. Hey, nice to meet you.